So anyway, Father, we just thank you for this night, and Lord, we do thank you for the word that you have spoken to our hearts as we have studied this last week, Father. Thank you for the obedience of your prophets, and Lord, for the, the scribes who put it down on paper so that we would have it. And God, that we would use the word that you have so generously given us and that we hide it in our hearts so that we don't sin against you. And Lord, as we go through this lesson tonight, that it would be you who speaks truth and righteousness and holiness. And Father, that we would sit here under your anointing so that your word could be hidden in our hearts. And Father, it would be through our mouths and through our lives, the way that we live before you. And I just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, review. I'm not going to ask you all to do the review. I'm just going to do it. So anyway, um, just quick, re well, kind of a quick recap and then review of the whole book of Malachi. Um, Malachi was written to the Jews who had returned from Babylon. The temple had been rebuilt in 526 B.C., but the people had fallen into a state of spiritual apathy. Um, the people are both disillusioned about their future, and they're also skeptical about God's promises. And Malachi is addressing the same problems as both Nehemiah and Ezra. And this generation was not guilty of the gross idolatry of their parents. You don't hear any idolatry once they come back from the Babylonian captivity. Uh, but they have embraced a dead orthodoxy. I'm not sure which is worse, but um, so anyway, uh, they ba basically what they tried to do was get away with a minimum effort um, that their faith required and still be blessed of God. And then they couldn't understand why they weren't being blessed. When we look at chapter one, verses one through five, we have God's covenant love um, for Israel and um, when he was telling them that he loved them, they said, well, how have you loved us? So he gave them the example of Jacob I have loved and Esau I have loved less. I have chosen you, but I have not chosen Esau. You are my blessed chosen people, but in not choosing Esau in the way that he has behaved, he will always be known as an evil or wicked country. And God will not allow him to keep to rebuild, and they will. He will completely destroy Edom. Then we get to verses um, one six through two sixteen, and this is where we have God rebuking Israel for her unfaithfulness. Uh, and uh, one six through two nine, we have the priests that are despising His name, and again they question, "Well, how are we doing that?" And He tells them, He says, "Look, you're offering defiled and polluted food on my altar." And you have caused people to stumble with your instruction, and you have corrupted the covenant of Levi. And then he goes and tells the people, he says, okay, you people, you're no better. And he uh, rebukes them for their unfaithfulness. Then we get to chapter 2, um, 10 through 17, which was last week. And it's um, how they were breaking the covenant of marriage. They were marrying foreign women. They were dealing treacherously with their brothers. They were weeping on God's altar because their sacrifices were not accepted and they were not blessed. They were divorcing their wives, which was breaking covenant. Um, he also addresses the abuses of the priesthood and the temple service. And we see all of the injustices that um, good is called evil and evil good. And the people want to know uh, where is your justice? In other words, the evil people are prospering and we, your people, are not. So why aren't you prospering us instead of them? And then uh, in 3.8, he's also going to, which we're going to talk about this week, um, he also is talking about their tithes and offering, that the covenant is being broken in their tithes and offerings. And then in 2.18 through 4.6, we're going to be studying the Lord coming and that his coming is going to be for purification and judgment and that the people are to rep repent and prepare for his coming and it is appropriate to repent and be ready for his coming. And then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, which is the whole chapter, it talks about the day of the Lord being certain. One thing I want to remind you guys of is when we study scripture, we need to remember that there were no chapter divisions and there were no verses, verse numbers. 
I don't know if I could live without verse numbers and chapter divisions, but when we are studying, we need to remember that just because one chapter is ending and another beginning doesn't mean that it should not have been all one reading. Um, so what, with that in mind, um, what do you think or what have you studied out that is the primary point of Malachi? Okay, so basically return to me, and then God says, I'll return to you. And from chapter 1, verse 1, we know that it's the burden. It's a burden or an oracle of the Lord, and it's the oracle or the burden was that even his priest did not honor or respect his name. And then the other thing that we see throughout all of it is that the Lord of hosts called his messengers and his people to fear his name. Did you notice how many times fear was used in the lessons the last couple days? couple times okay so chapter three okay um well actually at two seven go back to chapter two take your notebook out your notes out for chapter two and um what were the priests made to be and what had they done Okay, they're God's messengers, but they didn't give the truth. They corrupted it. They cor corrupted the priestly covenant, and they turned people away, causing many to stumble. And we've talked about this almost every week and multiple times, but how we live our life professing to be Christians, and then we do something that's opposite of what a Christian should do, that causes people to stumble. Mm -hmm. So we need to be very aware of what we do, not only in church, but out of church. It's like Sister Ann was talking about pastor last week. It doesn't matter where you see pastor, he's the same person. You don't have to worry. So he gives a correct interpretation of the truth. Okay? So when we looked um, at 217, they uh, go back and look at 217 real quick. It says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? And then it rolls right over into chapter 3, verse 1. It says, behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant, which is the Abrahamic covenant, in whom you delight, behold, um, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. Now, on page 27, uh, question 3, um, who is the messenger according to the Matthew scripture of Matthew 11, 1 through 10? Okay. And what about um, any, what, anything else? Okay, you can hold there. We don't have to go all that. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus is quoting Malachi 3.1. Okay, so we see over there in Matthew that, that Jesus is um, quoting Malachi 3.1, and he said it is, is, he is referring to John the Baptist. Now, what about Luke 1? What did you learn there? Listen, we're still on verse 1, so <laughs> it's also on page 27 of your homework, I hope. Go ahead. All right, so what we're having is we're getting we're we're being given the lineage of John the Baptist. So we know that he's of the priestly line or priestly descent, that he is the one who's cleared and prepared the way for Jesus, that his ministry was in Israel, and then in um Verse 16, it says that he will turn many in Israel back to the Lord their God and that he gave them the knowledge of salvation by forgiveness of sins. So who else is the messenger in Malachi uh, 3.1? Who's the messenger of the covenant? Jesus. 
<laughs> Jesus. Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. So we see it's the Lord himself, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what did you find out in Isaiah 42, 1 through 8, and Matthew 12, 15 through 21? Okay, so that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Isaiah scripture, right? And that he is God's servant, and he's going to bring justice to the nations. Um, and what were the people of Malachi's time asking? Remember, he's bringing justice, but what are the people of Malachi's times asking? And so what do they say? Okay, God, where's your justice? So that's the question. They're questioning him, where is your justice? Okay. Um, he's also God's servant, Jesus. Um, and it was a covenant. They're talking about the covenant here. It's a covenant for the people. And it's a covenant and it's a light to the people or a light to the nations. We see there. Now, when we, let's go back to verse 1. And when it talks about where he suddenly comes to his temple, this is going to be the temple of the end times. And you're going to find the reference to that in Zechariah 6, 11 through 15, which is going to be on your sheet. So you won't have to go there and write all of that down. Um, now, let's look at verses 2 through 5. The one thing I want to say about messenger before we go on is in the ancient royal processionals before the king would come in, the messenger would go before the king and announce where he was going. And then in the road, he would make certain that there were absolutely no obstacles at all. And he would make what John did straightway his path. So you see how it ties into what the tradition was there. Um, verse 2, it says, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap. Oh my goodness, like refiner's fire and, full, and uh, fuller soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Now, in the end times, now this isn't Jesus' first coming here. Now we're talking about his second coming, and what is going to happen is he's coming this time to refine to purify and to judge sin. And when it talks about the refiner's fire and the fuller soap, um, it talks about judgment as testing, not as destruction. And it talks about the fuller soap is cleansing. So he's coming back at a time to clean up and not destroy the sons of Levi. Because remember, they had to be cleaned up because they had so corrupted the covenant, the priesthood that God had spoken against them in chapters 1 and 2. Now, um, most of us have seen refining, refiner's fire, or we've talked about it before, but both gold and silver are refined by fire. And throughout the process, the refiner continues to scoop the dross or the slag off of the top, the impurities. And um, he only uses enough heat that is necessary to bring the impurities out. And he knows it has been purified totally when he can see a clear reflection of himself in the, in the silver or in the gold. Now, this is something when I went online re, uh, researching this yesterday. There is silver um, that will contain some metals that will not release with heat. So it doesn't matter how hot he gets the furnace, the impurities will not come out. So... What it is, is the silver then refuses to let go of, that, of the impurities. And then um, when that happens, the uh, refiner rejects the silver because it can't be purified. Now, apply that to what we go through. That's why scripture tells us that he only gives us what we can handle through his strength. Because he knows that the impurities in us will come out and then we will be refined as pure silver and pure gold. But there are others that it doesn't matter how much fire you put under their feet, so to speak, they are not relinquishing 
the sin in their life, so there is no salvation for them. So when I got said, oh, well, that answers a lot, doesn't it? You know? Right. Why, 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 why? Because they just don't want to um, give up that little petty sins in their lives. I'm seeing a face over here. You got a question? Can you? you? <laughs> oh, no. I'm hoping you were coming back in it. Oh, I'm so sorry. And listen, once the priesthood is purified, what is going to happen then is he says, then they're going to bring the correct offerings in righteousness. Those that have been so corrupt, they're now going to bring um, the correct offerings in righteousness. And then in verse 4 it says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. I kind of think the last time that the offerings were ever pleasing was during the time of David. <laughs> After that, I think it uh, just kind of hit the skids there. Um, so for those who are purified and washed clean, we will all bring in offerings of righteousness to the Lord. Of course, we will be in heaven celebrating and worshiping while all of this purification process is going on on the earth. Um, and then verse 5. There's a then. Then. You've been looking for me. I'm coming. And when I come, guess what? Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says Yahweh of hosts. The first thing that he addresses is sorcerers. And the reason for this is because when they were in Babylon, they learned magic and sorcery. So he is going to first judge the sorcerers. And we know that this is going on in Israel because in Acts 8, 9 through 13, you have Simon practicing magic in Samaria. And then in Acts 13, uh, 6 through 11, we have Bar Jesus, a magician and a Jewish false prophet. And Paul calls him the son of the devil, an enemy of righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, making the straight paths of the Lord crooked. And he was struck with temporary blindness. Now, if you read the whole chapter, he becomes saved. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so this is he's addressing the sorcerers first. And Or not. Or social, social gospel. gospel. Then they're going to be judged for it. Just like these folks of the sorcerers led the people. Into a Anybody who leads people away from God, there's a greater judgment. A greater, judgment. greater judgment for that. So thank you, Ann, for sharing that. So anyway, in his judgment, when he comes, it doesn't say he's going to lollygag around. He said it's going to be a swift witness. And he doesn't need anybody else to witness with him. He is doing it alone. It is going to be a swift witness. Now, it talks about um, when it says that they do not fear me, they don't reverence him. They, there's no awe of him. So when he comes in judgment, judgment is going to fall on all covenant breakers. And if you refuse to accept Christ, you're a covenant breaker. You will not enter in. So all of those who sit in churches day after day, week after week, and are professing Christ, it's going to be swift judgment for them. Mm -hmm. Swift judgment, okay? Um, this uh, reminds me of Jesus in Matthew um, 10, 28. Let me see if I wrote it down. I might not have. Um, that it says when it talks about uh, do not fear in Matthew 10, 28, when, it talks, he says, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, mm -hmm. but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And 
that should be a very sobering thought for all of us. We are not to fear God that he's going to zap us, but we fear God with a reverential awe uh, because of who he is. So we're not supposed to fear man because that's a snare to us, but we are to fear God. And I look at this country, and it's not just us, it's all over the world, but I look at this country and see how sorcery has become rampant mm -hmm. here. I mean, witchcraft, Satan worship, it's mainstream. It is absolutely mainstream now. Um, books, movies, TV shows, podcasts. And this is stuff from years ago, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And that was aimed at the minds of our children. Yes. So it became an open gate for them to think that sorcery and magic and witchcraft and all of this stuff um, is acceptable. And now we're not, we're not black witches. We don't do dark things. We're white witches. We do good magic. A witch is a witch is a witch. Okay, <laughs> and when it says that, you know, they were supposed to take care of the sojourner, they were supposed to help feed him, and the fatherless and the widow, that was their responsibility to do that. And when it talks about oppressing the hired worker, James 5, 4 says, you rich, you should be shaken in your boots because you have withheld the wages of your daily worker, and they can't buy bread. If you don't pay them, they can't buy bread. So um, for those of you who have yard guys, Pay your yard guy when you're supposed to. Don't let it go three months at a time. Right. If your cleaning lady comes in, you pay her the day she cleans your house. You know, that's just, that's just the way it is. And then verse 6, after all this darkness and everything, then you get to verse 6, and it says, For I, Yahweh, I do not change. And Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, God's Jesus, Jesus is God, and neither one of them change. And it says, therefore, you, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. It is because God is a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. What God promises, what he covenants, he keeps. If God does not and did not keep his covenant, his promise to Israel, then we as the body of Christ have no confidence, no expectation that he would keep covenant with us. And if you have no other verses, this verse right here says that God's not finished with Israel and the church has not replaced her. Mm -hmm. And did you know that most of the mainline denominations feel that the church has replaced Israel? Mm -hmm. And that's why they are not out supporting Israel in this time that is going on. But what are they doing? He's not going to do anything because he's blessing these evil people. We're just going to keep getting away with all this stuff. But what do we learn from 2 Peter 3, 4? I hope I wrote it down. Maybe not. I'll have to go back. But anyway, write down 2 Peter 3, 4. But in Lamentations 3, 22, it says that um, they are turning his long suffering basically into a skeptical denial of his coming judgment. Um, and we also see in Ecclesiastes 8, 11, and then in Romans 2, 4 through 10, um, if you want to look those up later on, and I might get down to hit them here. But now as we look at um, tithes and offerings, verse 7, it says, From the days of your fathers, <laughs> you have turned aside for my statutes and have not kept them. It's almost like he's begging. He says, I love you. I have chosen you. The lineage is through Jacob. You are my chosen people. I have given you all of these statutes for godliness, for blessing, and you've turned your back on them just as your fathers did. So please, please, children, return to me. And if you will return to me, then I can return to you. And then what do they say? Have. How, how shall we return? So... Listen, is this simple ignorance or is this a deliberate choosing not to know? I don't know, but think about it. When's the last time somebody came up to you? Oh, you know, I didn't realize that's what you really wanted me to do. 
In other words, I didn't feel like doing it, so I'm going to pretend like I didn't understand it. Okay? Oh, goodness, 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 goodness. Okay. And so then he says, um, you have robbed me in your tithes and your contributions. Now, robbing God means that they are taking what is his. And, you know, we have said for years that he, we are to tithe 10% and God gives us the other 90%. So what he's telling the people, he says, look, I'm giving you 90%. It's not that part of is not being robbery because I've given that to you. It's the ten percent that you owe me, basically. Okay, um, so they weren't asking how to return. They weren't asking how to repent. What they're doing is um, there are how can we return or repent if we don't know how we have sinned. Well, so does that mean that they've stopped reading any Torah? That they don't know what any of the laws are? They're pleading ignorance? Over and over and over. They're the priest. Over and over and over. All over again. Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who are dwell in it. It's all his. It is all his. And here they are begrudging him the small amount of what they were given. Um, okay, so he says then, he says, you are cursed. Yeah. And you're cursed because you're robbing me. You're giving me sick, lame, stolen animals and you're not even bringing the grain in that you need to. And it's the whole nation of you that is doing this. He said, look, he says, I love you. I want you to repent. I want you to be walking in my ways. You're only not destroyed because of my steadfast love. Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Thank God or we'd all be toast. You know? Um, so let's go ahead and on, in your homework uh, on page 29, the question C, Exodus. What did you learn about tithes and offerings or tithes and contributions? So the major festivals, they were supposed to be, all the men were supposed to gather together. And obviously, if the men are coming, the families are coming because they're going to be feasting and celebrating at the major feast there. And it also says that none were to appear before him empty-handed. They were to bring an offering from something that he had blessed them with. So if you get a $1,000 bonus... I like $10,000. You get a $10,000 bonus. You pay your tithe, right? And because you've been so blessed with this $10,000 bonus, you don't go out and put a down payment on a new car, but you bless the Lord with some of it. You put it somewhere in the kingdom. That's what that's talking about there, okay? Okay. So um, what had God taught his people about tithing? And that's on page 30, questions 3, um, A and B. It's on Deuteronomy 12, 10 through 12 and 14, 22 through 29. And please, if I start talking too fast, somebody just go like this at me, okay? Not bad, not second, yeah, not flawed. It should be choice, okay? Exactly, right. And then in turn, remember we talked about that, then the priest, um, the Levites would tithe to the priest, and then the priest would do the tithe, okay? So it's in the law. It, the Lord required Israel to present the offerings, the sacrifices, and the tithes. 
and it wasn't to be from some of their stuff. It was to be from all the produce, all the flocks, and all the herds. So in our modern English, everything we make money on, we should be giving a portion to the Lord, okay? Um, what was the tithe given to the Levites? The tithe was given to the Levites. What? Well, we just talked about it. It's the tenth, okay? And it was collected in third year. And a portion of this was to be used in their own hometowns, right? Yes. So that the strangers could be fed, that the orphans could be fed, that the widows could be, be, be taken care of. And what were they doing? Remember when he, he said they were taking everything away from the widows, the orphans, the sojourners in the land. And what was happening in Malachi and Nehemiah, in Nehemiah's time, according to page 29, question 2, A and B. And that's Nehemiah 10, 32 through 39, and 13, 10 through 14. Um, it is page 29, question 2, A and B. And it's Nehemiah and... Um, it's Nehemiah, excuse me, I've lost my place here. Sorry. It's Nehemiah 10, 32 through 39, and 13, 10 through 14. And please tell me I didn't. So basically, this was for the upkeep of the temple, the priest and the Levites, right? So probably when Nehemiah was the governor of Judah, and then he had to return to Babylon for a while, they weren't giving the tithes and the offerings, so the Levites had to stop doing what God had ordained them to do, and they had to go back into the fields in order to feed themselves instead of being able to receive the tithes from the people. When we do not give as a body, then the upkeep of the church goes by the wayside because electricity can't be paid for. I think we have water bills here too, don't we? The water bill can't be paid for. Yeah. Heavens to Bessie a salary, you know, and the air conditioning for the, you know. So, and I'm not a harp. I am harping, aren't I? But we have a responsibility to God yes. to be givers. Not because somebody comes in the pulpit and takes an offering on Sunday. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so, but when Nehemiah returned to Judah, he again had to correct their sin. Um, on page 30, question 4A, Leviticus 22, 17 through 25, what did you learn? And I think Anne's addressed this a little bit already. There were to be free will offerings. Okay. And these are made in, uh, they had to be made without defect. Had to have cattle, sheep, or goat. Um, no defective animals, which would be a sin. <laughs> page 31, 1 Chronicles 29, 6 through 17. Yes, and what's so, what, to me, what's so amazing about this is David is not going to ever see this temple. He's not going to see one mm -hmm. cornerstone laid, nothing he will see. But what he does, he leads the people into giving willingly, giving freely, and giving generously to the treasury for the building of the Lord's temple. And then what, you, just like you said, Linda, then there was rejoicing and then there was praise, and he recognizes that all that the people gave was from the Lord. Was from the Lord, okay? What about Ezra 1, 4 through 6? Everyone who was born to the ark leaped from Jacob as a free will offering for the house in Jerusalem of silver, gold, goods, cattle, and they would use it uh, to build free will churches. Thank you. 
and free will offerings. What is so amazing is what the, when the order came out, it was, okay, all of you Jewish people who would like to return, you are free to go. You're not slaves in the city, but everybody around you will need to contribute to your going. So all of your Jewish brethren, all your neighbors, they can contribute to your going. What do we do when we send missionaries out to the field? We take offerings up to be able to equip them to get them on the mission field. So basically, these are the missionaries going back into the land to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the wall, to rebuild the city, and they're going to have a great need of many, many things. Okay, so that was Ezra. Now, I think on page 31, question 5, what did you learn about the tithes given before the law? Melchizedek. Yes. And um, that was before anything was, um, you know, he was, he, he was a perpetual priest. Yes. And, um, and those who indeed were sent to me uh, were commanded in the law to collect a tenth of the people. Okay. And isn't it interesting that Levi paid a tithe through Abraham while, be, while he was in the loins? So, okay. Um, what about Genesis? And this was a rabbit hole that I went down, this, the last Melchizedek, but we're, I'm not going to take you down that rabbit hole with me. Genesis 28, 20 through 22. Okay, so Jacob or Israel vowed to give a tenth back to God of all that he gave him, right? And that was, um, all right, what about on page 32, Acts 2, 41 through 47? This is about New Testament tithing. So what they were doing at the beginning of the church, the believers were selling everything that they had so that they could meet the needs of everybody who had needs. Now, this isn't a commune. This is community, meeting the needs of others, okay? And the gladness, the sincerity of heart, the generous hearts, the praising God, and the favor with the people, um, with the, the attitudes of the results of their fellowship. I think about that if we tried to do that today. Can you imagine if we tried to do that today? Just, just those of us sitting in the room, if God spoke to all of us, okay, he says, I want all of you to go home, sell your houses, buy a less expensive car, empty out all of your savings accounts, empty out your investment accounts, and I want you to bring everything into the church, and then Pastor Roberts is going to give it out to everybody that has need. I know. But I mean, that's what they were saying. That was because there was such great need in meeting the needs. And listen, I have no problem with meeting needs. I have problems with giving people stuff that don't want to work. And scripture says, if a man does not work, he does not eat. Okay, on another one. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. Okay, the first day of the week is Sunday, by the way, because and the Israelis do it one day, two day, three day, four day. They don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Friday. It's day one, day two. So their day one was Sunday. And um, as the givers prospered, they gave to other believers who weren't as prosperous as they were. So giving was a regular was at regular periods. Giving was planned. It was proportional, and it was private. 
can you, if, if we all came into church on Sunday and say, oh, I've got my tithe check, it's $250, how much is yours? <laughs> so it needs to be private. Uh, 2 Corinthians um, 8 and 9. Ray, do you have anything written down? I do. Good. <laughs> I've had all the answers everybody else had, but I have it four or five words, so it says it's the next thing. Right. Give us the four or five words. I have quite a lot written. Freely willing to give. Freely willing to give, okay. Okay. The only thing that I would add is they gave out of their poverty, yeah. you know, they gave out of their poverty, and uh, Paul called it grace, um, but they were joyful to give out of their poverty to help those in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was going through a horrendous famine. Yeah. There was no money. There was no food, so that's what they were doing, these poor people. They, they were doing. They first gave of themselves to the Lord. Yes. If you give your well, this is going to be later on too, but if you give yourself to the Lord, you don't have to worry about the other stuff because he's going to move on your heart to take care of the other things. Okay, so a cheerful giver is described as a purposed, being purposed or decided in heart uh, to not be grudging or reluctantly giving and not under compulsion because if anybody compels you to give, then you are not freely giving. So when you are this kind of a giver, then you will have abounding, uh, God's going to give you abounding grace. You're going to always have all sufficiency. You're going to have abundance, um, in ab and you're going to abound in every good work or deed. And you will enrich in everything for liberality so that you can be generous to others. And you will have thanksgiving to God. Yeah. I think we should, one Sunday, have everybody stand up and jump up and down with their ties, thanking God that they had food on their table this week and that the light bill was paid, just to um, see. Um, so what about Luke 16, 11? Oh, you know what? It's not on your page. <laughs> it's one I'm going to give you. <laughs> um, in Luke 16, 11, it says, You have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth. Who will entrust you with true riches? And this illustrates for us that giving and financial uh, management is, spiritual, is not only a spiritual issue, excuse me, is a spiritual issue and a financial issue. Because it goes back and it, scripture tells us that we cannot serve two masters. If we serve God, if we serve him, then we're going to be financially responsible and we're not going to rob him. Uh, verse 10. That was Luke 16, 11. It's on your sheet. Okay. Um, verse 10, it says, Now, if they would repent and if they would return and if they would follow what God had said about offerings and tithes, he says, If you would only bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test. This is the only place in Scripture that God ever says put me to the test. The only place. And what this says is, I want you to prove me, says Yahweh of hosts. If I will not then open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. So he's saying, listen, repent, return to me, keep my laws, keep my ways, and then I can open the windows of heaven for you. Um, and the only time in the New Testament, excuse me, I don't want to go there yet. Um, and then he says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says Yahweh of hosts. And then all nations will call you, cause you blessed, call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says Yahweh of hosts. There's a couple things here. When Israel went to the land in 1948, it was rocks and desert. Now it is blooming and beautiful. When they were in Gaza, mm -hmm. it was full of farms and crops and everything else. As soon as they walked out of the land, the land stopped producing. I mean, that's just the way that it is. Um, in, verse, in verse 10, it's the only time 
uh, the only time tithing is mentioned in the New Testament was when Jesus was speaking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and that's Matthew 23, 23, and the corresponding verse is also Luke eleven forty two. The only mention of tithing is in New Testament um, when Jesus was upbraiding the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now, before we go on, I want to... Um, I read this in the Moody Bible Commentary, and um, I thought it was, um, it was worth sharing. So I'm going to share. It's, it's about verse 10, 11, and 12. It says, The promise of agricultural blessing is based on uh, Israel's obedience to the law in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. The promise is tied to those under the Mosaic Covenant. It is not a guarantee to those living under the New Covenant. However, in the New Testament, it indicates that believers who give generously, sacrificially, and with cheerful hearts will experience spiritual blessings. Okay. So anyway, and that's, um, that's going to be 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11, and I think we looked that up anyway. Uh, 13 through 15, this is actually the last dispute that God says that he has with them. He says, your words have been hard against me. And the Hebrew for hard here is the same word used of Pharaoh's hard heart. So this indicates um, the people's rebellion against God. It says, but, but you say, how have we spoken against you? And once again, <laughs> you have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Hard words, arrogant hearts, calling the evil good, the good evil, putting God to the test, allowing them to escape. God, it's just not worth serving you. We now will call, this is the people of Israel, we now will call the arrogant blessed. And the evildoers who are not only prospering, but they put you to the test and you're letting them escape. And by saying this, they are justifying or they're feeling justified and not keeping the law. And when it talks about um, walking around as in mourning, this is an outward show. This is not true humility. This is just all for outward show. 16 through 18, it says, and then those who, and I love we're gone for bad to good. It says, then those who feared the Lord, once again feared, uh, spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. The people who feared the Lord, they were coming together. They were defending God's righteous dealings, and they were encouraging one another. And as they were doing this, then what he does is he comes to them listening to them. And what does he say? He says, okay, I'm going to put them in my book of remembrance because they have a fe they have." feared me, and they have esteemed my name. So they feared, they esteemed, they spoke well of him, unlike the priests and Levites. They blessed the Lord and did not curse. They understood that the fear of the Lord was the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This group understood the greatness, the glory, and the power of God, and they revered him for who he is. What a contrast to the other guys. Verse 17, and because of these people, and if you want to go with uh, the remembrance, if you go back to Esther um, 6, 1 through 2, it was really common that the kings would have books of remembrance of when people had done good things for them. And then they would bring it back out and say, oh, I remember you did this really good thing for me. And that's how Mordecai and the Jews did not get. Um, in Revelation, it says he opened the books. He opened the books, plural. Mm -hmm. There's more than one book. And so this probably, you know, is in the book of remembrance. Yeah, I think there's, it well. It seems. It, it seems, yeah. To do that. I think so. I think there's, um, anyway. So uh, verse 17, God is always going to have a remnant. He says, they shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. He calls them his treasured possession, and he, they will be spared. When you talk, in, in 1 Kings 19, 18, Elijah flees Jezebel, feeling he's the only one left, and God tells him, oh, Elijah, I have 7,000 who have not bowed to Baal. He had a remnant. 
And then in Romans 11, 4 through 5, Paul quote, quotes the king's passage, but he adds to it. He says, uh, so too at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So it doesn't matter how corrupt our society or how apostate the church, God will always have a remnant. And we are part of that remnant. We are that part of that remnant because we are the ones who will esteem him, honor him, and glorify him and keep his commandments. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay? And we love him. Verse 18. Then once more, to me, this is, this is going right back to the heart of what the evil people are doing. Then once more, you'll see, you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not. You're calling evil good and good evil and telling me that I am not a just God. You don't serve me, but my remnant does. So you're going to see what a righteous person who serves me gets and what um, a wicked person who doesn't serve me, doesn't serve me gets. Um, so anyway, and then that takes us over into chapter uh, 4, verse 1. This carries right on through. Remember, there's no chapter uh, titles. He says, I'm going to show you righteous reward and I'm going to show you wicked reward. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evil evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says Yahweh of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Neither root nor branch. In other words, no root, no hope, no second chance. Okay? Um, let's jump back to tithing for just a second before we do this. We have time. So, doing all of the um, cross-references that we did on tithing, <coughs> would you say that tithing is, a new test, is for the New Testament? No! <laughs> is tithing New Testament? And no, it is not. It's Old Testament. We still give. And you might have to edit this out, so just kind of hold on. 10% is only the starting point. I mean, if God was requiring 10% under the law so that the priests and the Levites and the work of the temple could go on. But we have been blessed so abundantly that we should be giving more than our 10%. And what you give is in accordance with what your income is. Somebody who makes $200,000 a year can give far above what I can with, with what I have every month. But it doesn't absolve me for, from giving from what I have been blessed with. Because anything you have is a blessing from God. Okay, here we go. Verse 2. So there is no root, there is no hope. There is no root, there is no hope. But a very good contrasting word. I'm going to contrast for those who fear my name. For those of you who fear my name, the remnant, the son of righteousness, and in Psalm 8411, you will see that the son of righteousness uh, refers to Jesus, shall rise with healing in its wings. You the saved, the remnant, the ones who fear my name. You shall go out leaping like calves from a stall. Have you ever been on a farm anywhere where the animals have been pinned up overnight, the babies, and when they open that gate, what happens? They are crazy running around the field, kicking up their heels. So when we are saved, we're like that little baby calf just running around the field, jumping and kicking our legs because we have been saved from bondage. We are set free. 
Okay. Um, and you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I ask, act, says Yahweh of hosts. The day is coming. The wicked, the arrogant, the evildoers, they're going to be chaff. They're going to be stubble. They're going to have no root or any branch. But those who are, called by, who are called by his name, who fear his name, who revere who he is, then the son of righteousness is going to rise and to heal them. And they're going to go forth and skip like calves. And can you imagine treading down the wicked where there are ashes under our feet? And then we have a command in verse 4. It says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. If they had remembered the law of Moses, there would have not been the book of Malachi. There would have been no burden, no oracle. Okay, so our last two verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Okay, page 34, question 6. 2 Kings 2, 1 through 3 and 11 and 12 and Genesis 5, 21 through 24 and Hebrews 11, 5. It's all at once. What did you guys learn there? Anybody? No, he, that, thank you, Betty. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, not in a chariot of fire. Okay, <laughs> he came. The the chariot and the, they separated, and he went up in a whirlwind. Okay, do you know how many people think Elijah went up in the chariot of fire? <laughs> Ray did. <laughs> yes, whirlwind. Okay. <laughs> I love to pick on Ray. Okay. Um, all right. So, what else? What, it, what else from Genesis and, he, Genesis and Hebrews? All right. So, we have two people. We have Elijah and uh, Elijah, Elijah and Enoch, who have not died. Okay. What else did we learn? What did you learn from Hebrews nine twenty seven? So we don't get to die multiple times, right? So it's appointed for man to die once. What about a Matthew? What about Matthew eleven seven through fourteen? So basically, uh, Jesus said, uh, he told the people of Israel that if they had been willing to accept John the Baptist was Elijah, the one who, was, who came to prepare his way by preaching repentance and restore hearts and lives, but who, they didn't accept it. The rank and file people did, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they did not. And because they didn't accept it as a whole, the nation did not repent. Okay? What about Matthew 17, 1 through 4 and 9 through 13? Linda, you got something? Anybody else? I had verse 11 where it says Elijah will restore all things. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so basically in Matthew 17, it's the Mount of Transfiguration, right? So then um, Peter, James, and John are seeing Elijah, and um, they ask about his, you know, the first coming and this 
did the, all this. They said, okay, is he coming before you on the second coming? So then Jesus does reply that Elijah is coming to restore. So it appeared, I am not saying, but it appears that Elijah might be one of the witnesses. Okay? And when we go to Revelation, which we do have time to do that. Um, so he told them, he said, look, he said, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him, but they're going to recognize him the second time before when my second coming. Okay. So there's about 400 years between Malachi and John the Baptist and Jesus's first coming. And Israel did not recognize his first coming, which was for salvation. So they will recognize him at the second coming because it's going to be for judgment and restoration. So Revelation 11, uh, 1 through 13, it's on page 35 and it's the E question. Uh, what did you guys learn from that, which we kind of talked about? <laughs> uh, that they were told to measure the uh, temple and the altar out, not the court outside the temple. Two witnesses to prophesy for 1,260 days and fast on. And if they're harmed, fire will flow out from their mouth. Which is an Elijah thing. Sounds like Egypt, doesn't it? And when the testimony is finished, these children, their dead bodies will lie in the street for three and a half days. And after three and a half days, the breath of God raises them up on their feet, and they are taken to heaven. Okay. So this, in a revelation, this happens before the second coming. They are killed at the midpoint of the tribulation period and they are going to be they witness and prophesy of the Lord in Jerusalem they are in Jerusalem and then they are killed after the three and a half years now going back um, I've lost my no I've lost my place again sorry okay what is a possible title or chapter theme um, for this for um, chapter four sorry Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Elijah will turn their hearts to still the day of the Lord. Okay, anybody else? Okay, anybody else? These are all good. The arrogant and those who fear God's name, it is coming, and Elijah is sent. Just something different. And also, what about a chapter theme for chapter uh, 3? Sorry, I know I jumped all over the place. Okay, anybody else? My messenger is coming. My messenger is coming, okay. Ray, did you come up with one? I have no idea where you're at. If you don't, that's okay. I just usually, I know you have something. <laughs> okay. All right, so how about this one um, for chapter 3? The Lord's coming, robbing God, those who fear the Lord. Chapter 3 was actually in three specific segments. So for, for each of those segments. Um, Okay, so I know we had confusion about tithes and offerings, and I'm sorry, that was not my um, intention. Um, no, no, but... Um, To give, right. Regardless of how much or how, how little. In the sight of God. Because it's proportional. It is. It's the same. Right. It's a proportional. Okay, so I've got a couple takeaways, and some were in your notes. Um, 
as a believer in the New Testament era, which we have talked and talked and talked, uh, what do you think God expects regarding giving? Free will, generous, according to our ability, um, joyfully, joyfully, okay? Um, the second thing is, is grace, because we're living under grace, is grace a license to ignore God's commands or commandments, or is grace the power to keep them? Okay, those are your, those are your takeaways. So is grace a license to ignore God's commandments, or is grace the power to keep them. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you, uh, that I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. So if you have his heart, he gives you the ability to walk in his statutes and to obey his rules. Those are your takeaways. Um, and it's on your, with all your other scriptures. Any other questions? Okay. Father, I just thank you for tonight. And Lord, even through all the confusion and talking back and forth, Father, that, that you would have instructed us in the way that you have chosen and desire for us to walk. And Father, I think the bottom line is this, that you have loved us with an everlasting, steadfast love and that you have given us salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ because you do love us. And because you do, and we have accepted that great love, that we in turn love you back by obeying your commandments and walking in your ways, not out of legalism or have to do, but because we desire to please you in all things. And I just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.